In this episode, I'm going to discuss whether it's necessary for you to create your own original pantheon for your homebrewed campaign. I'm going to discuss kind of the pros and cons of whether this is a good idea. Then I'm going to give my tips on building a pantheon and an origin story for your universe because this can seem daunting because not only are you creating a whole world with a homebrewed campaign, but now you're having to explain how that world came to be. But there are ways to do this uh, to make it a little simpler. And what it does is it creates for your players the sense that they are in a fully realized universe in your homebrewed campaign. So let us speak of the gods. Hello again, I'm K.R. King. This is my YouTube channel dedicated to homebrewing your own campaign. When I outlined my sample campaign of Melanor, I mentioned that I was going to be using the Greyhawk Pantheon for my clerics, for my god system. And in that discussion, I said, uh, you could use any of the pantheons that are given in the books, uh, or you could homebrew your own pantheon. Uh, and then I had a subscriber who said in a comment, he said, look, I want to get started on my home group brood campaign, but uh, I'm having a problem building a pantheon. To which the first reaction I have is, dude, don't worry, start your campaign, just use one of the pantheons, that's what I did. But there is a sentiment out there, well, but if I'm going to really create a, a full universe, a world that's truly my own, shouldn't I create my own gods? Shouldn't I create a system that's totally unique, uh, that ties into the way the game works, but is my own creation? You can do that. I, there are reasons that I would say to perhaps not worry about it, which I'm going to give here, but certainly you can do that. And certainly I did this in the past. Uh, I had several campaigns where I had fully realized pantheons. For example, when we first started playing in the 70s, the, the box set, you know, edition zero or whatever, uh, we created a pantheon because, frankly, the clerics kind of sucked. They weren't very good in terms of the other players. So what we did, we created a whole host of gods. We had warrior gods where the clerics could use weapons. We had uh, neutral gods where they, uh, we had a fire priest uh, that could throw fireballs and things. An air priest had, you know, control weather and all these different... We had a death priest. We, we, in those days, you, we ran evil characters. We realized uh, along the way that that was not a good idea. But we had these characters. And what happened, we're not... You know, we didn't play test these very well. We're not really game designers at this time. We were just kids, right? And what happened was the clerics became the favorite characters. I had a, a friend of mine always played a fire priest, loved it. He could use weapons as a neutral cleric and throw spells. They, they got out of bounds. And what happened for me was as the additions went along, they integrated the clerics uh, better into the system. People, things kind of balanced out. Again, you know, wizards at the end are very powerful, but still the clerics were not as worthless of characters within the system. So for me, the homebrewing of the Pantheon kind of fell away. Now, the other thing about a pantheon in D&D &D versus a historical pantheon is they serve different purposes. In real life, a pantheon is created or evolves or however it comes to be out of a sense of what, why is the world the way it is? Where did the world come from and why do things happen as they happen? You know, oftentimes, why do bad things happen to good people? This kind of thing. And the pantheon and gods serve as a purpose for this. Also, it's tied into the social fabric of a civilization where the priests uh, help perform certain functions in terms of birth and death and marriage and all this other stuff. So it has a true social purpose and a philosophical purpose in terms of the meaning of the world. In Dungeons & Dragons, the Pantheon doesn't necessarily serve this way. It's for a game. It's for the mechanics of a game to run a clerical system, uh, to, yes, flesh out and make a world seem real, but it doesn't have that same function. And you see this in the lack of an origin story in the rules of D&D. Uh, and I might be wrong here, but as far as I know, in terms of all the various additions and supplements and whatnot, there hasn't really been an explanation of how the world came to be. The gods are here. Uh, there are old, forgotten gods. There are gods in the past. There are remains of God on the astral plane. Uh, but again, nothing is like, this is what there was, and then the gods came forth and created the world. Now, you know, there's arguments back and forth. And again, somebody out there might say, well, in this supplement, it shows the origin of the D&D universe. Okay. But I think the reason that, you know, there was a sense of the satanic panic and all that stuff way back when. And maybe, you know, TSR, all these people didn't want to go into that. They didn't want to go into the origin story of the world to fuel the fire for people that were opposed to d and I don't know. Uh, but the point is, is that if you're going to create a pantheon, do you just want to create that pantheon in terms of the gods that fit into the D&D &D system? Or are you trying to create an origin story for your world? 
So I think some of the impulse that people have in terms of creating a pantheon is the fantasy books they've read, you know, like Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, where he had worked out this elaborate cosmology, uh, you know, uh, pantheon and all this stuff way before he ever wrote the books. So we feel like, well, I should be doing that as well. Now, what I would argue is that uh, he did, he wrote this all out in the Silmarillion, right? But how many people have enjoyed reading the Lord of the Rings books, which has all this background stuff kind of woven in, or the actual book, The Silmarillion, which contains all these legends? I would say most people enjoy reading Lord of the Rings. And in fact, I would say that most people have never gotten through The Silmarillion. So the thing to remember is what's interesting is the action of the world. If your character, as I said in the last episode, is Frodo Baggins, if your player characters are the central uh, protagonists in the world, we're not really interested in things that happened, you know, 5,000 years before. And when you think of the game mechanics, we call upon the gods in terms of, well, first of all, they give you the spells as a cleric. You also call upon them for information or inspiration. You know, when you're desperate, you call upon the gods and they may help you, especially, you know, you're role playing here and showing how you're helping the gods. But you're not interacting with them at a level of beyond very, you know, controlled environment. And you're not really worried about the relationships between them. You're not influencing those relationships. Now, having said those kind of cons, what are the pros? Well, first of all, it does create a sense that your world is truly unique, truly complete. The players are in there and it can contribute to a meta story. If you have a story of your campaign, you're envisioning your players going from first to 20th and working out some great cosmic struggle, the gods may be involved. And if the gods are involved, is there some story tracing back to the origins of the universe or the origins of your pantheon that the player characters can be involved in, even if you know somewhat peripherally, and they can take part in that and finish that off. So there is that meta aspect that can be important. The other thing is it can be really fun to create your own deities. I like it when the player characters find some forgotten deity or some thing that no one knows about and whether or not they, they bring it forth in terms of worshiping it or they, they you know bring about a new group of adherents or acolytes or something, this can be really interesting. So if you do want to create your pantheon for your world, the other element is don't be overwhelmed. You don't have to spend two years in your basement working out you know the, all the gods and their relationships and how this started and that and work it all the way down thousands of years. You can actually do this fairly simply because as I mentioned, the pantheon in D&D is worked out for the rules of the game, for the mechanics of the game. So when you're thinking of your pantheon, the first thing you want to think about is how does it work into the rule system you're using? So in D&D 5e, you want it to work into the domains. So a, a knowledge god, what sort of knowledge is this? And then you have the, the alignments. You have a lawful good knowledge god, a neutral knowledge god and an evil knowledge god, right? And those, those domains overlap. You have multiple domains. You just look at the books, look at the various uh, pantheons that they show you, and then you create your own. You know, you can get on the internet, like there's a whole series of Baltic gods, right? There's a whole series of Mesoamerican gods. There's, you know, gods from uh, the, the Baltic and the Balkans, right? There's all sorts of different gods. You can look them up and, and, and take them and use them and think about them in terms of their relationship to the world. And you don't worry about, in this example, the origin of the universe or anything. You're just trying to create your own gods uh, f that are unique to you. And then the nice thing about not worrying about the origin story is you just have gods that are for the orcs or the evil creatures or the mind flayers or whatever, and you don't have to explain how they all came to be. You just say, you know, these are the gods I have, these are the gods, here's how they line up with the domains, here's how they line up with the various races, okay, let's play. If you want to work out your origin story, then it's a little different. Then you have the relationships with the gods, then you have how the universe came to be, it's a little more complicated. The method that I always use, this is just mine, you can use whatever, is I would always have some primordial one solid state chaos, right? Or, you know, nothingness, darkness, or you are, you know, the mentality of the one creator. Whatever it is, this sort of oneness and out of this comes many. You're just trying to create, there was this sort of let there be light moment with out of the primordial chaos, the God or the gods emerged, right? And then from there, it works its way down. What I would say is there's two examples that I've used in the past to create gods. The first is the sort of familial family relationship of the gods that you see in like the Greek uh, pantheon or the Norse pantheon. Uh, and it builds out from, you know, a pair of parents and whatever, and then goes down through their kids. And they all have these relationships based on family relations or whatever. 
Uh, then you also have the fall from grace pantheon. And this is sort of the, where you have this perfect universe, everything is wonderful, and then somebody decides they get envious or jealous, or they want power, and they fall from grace. And then you have this dualistic uh, sort of pantheon in which you have good versus evil, light versus dark. So in the Greek pantheon, you have this chaos out of which comes Uranus, the sky, Gaia, the earth, uh, they're the first parents of the gods. And they have these children, the Titans, and the sun, Kronos, rises up. He castrates Uranus, throws them over. And they, in turn, are thrown over by their children, led by Zeus. And they're like people. They get mad at each other. They get jealous. Uh, you don't mess with Zeus. Just ask Sisyphus that, right, rolling his rock. Uh, Zeus runs the show. But uh, you also have... In the Greek system, fate with a capital F, the more that Zeus cannot control. The fates are mysterious, inscrutable. They do things that no one can understand, and even Zeus can't, you know, deny their powers. It's the ethos here is events are occurring out of this people's, the God's anger or jealousy or, or love or whatever. It isn't necessarily your fault. It's the gods working out their issues like people do in the world, like the kings and queens and like the big shots in the world do. You know, us little people on the ground, we are just at their whim, but it's not our fault because we're just simple folk. Now, if you have the fall from grace pantheon, you have this sort of perfect world, perfect plane of existence, these angels or whatever, that everyone's going along great, and then one of them becomes corrupt. They become envious. They want all the power themselves, and they fall from grace. We see this in the Tolkien pantheon. The Valar are all there making their music and Melkor decides my music is better. I want to play all the songs and he falls away and starts this battle. In this world your actions are you either opposed, right? This is dualism. There's one side or the other and you as a human being have to choose your side. We see this with the uh, Star Wars kind of thing, the force and you know evil versus good. Uh, and it's very much you are uh, responsible for your actions and you you know, pay for those. You, you align yourself with the right side. Now, and it's interesting because if you think of the battle in Tolkien, the battle with Sauron is not an economic battle. It's not a territorial. It's not like, you know, we deserve to live here and so we're going to take this over and then we're going to have a peace treaty. No, it's a battle of annihilation. It is a religious war in the sense that all or nothing. We will win and totally destroy you, right? And so this, you know, fall from grace uh, pantheon cosmology very much has this aspect of all or nothing, uh, one side wins, one side loses. So as I mentioned, the creating of the origin story for your world in terms of the, the cosmic origin story of all the different planes of existence and the gods can seem very daunting and, you know, depending on how much you want to work it out. But don't forget, what are people going to know on the ground? What is the story they're going to tell and this can be fairly simple. They're not necessarily going to all have a blueprint for how all the different planes of existence were created. This is for the gods to worry about. So when you create your origin story, just think of one uh, the average person would know. It doesn't have to be complicated. If you, you know, have someone that run, is a cleric and they get up to 20th level, they're going to know a little bit more about the, relation, the true relationship of the gods, how they began. And, and this might be information that is not only very useful, but held in secret or something, or it contains some clue to some cosmic struggle. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, if you want to create a pantheon, and I've done it, if you want to create an origin story for your world, I've done it. It's really fun, but you don't have to. And I don't think your world, your homebrewed world, is not real without your own pantheon. Uh, it's just as real to the players. They're going to have fun playing in your world because you're going to create encounters and situations. You're going to create NPCs with desires and motivations. You're going to remember that they are the antagonist and protagonist of the world. That's what's going to be fun. So again, thank you so much for watching. If you like what you seen please subscribe I'm always looking for more subscribers please leave comments i love to hear the what you're looking for what you're thinking about and in the meantime keep playing D, &D and tell somebody else about it